Coming up, China launches a new rocket. China debuts a new rocket. And SpaceX is testing a new rocket. Plus, we're going to be talking about commercial space flight updates. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. Welcome to tomorrow, episode 8.28 for Saturday, September 26, 2015. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me, as always, the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented, Bing, Carrie Ann Higginbotham. <laughs> she missed me. I was gone last Bing. week. Bing. We'll be your hosts for this episode. Now, before we get started, a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who helped me make this specific episode of this episode happen. I did it again. <laughs> I did it again. Oh, that's this awesome. specific segment of this episode happened. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this episode. If you'd like to find out more on how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. That list keeps getting longer and longer. Thank you to everyone for help crowdfunding this show so we can bring this to you week after week. All right, let's go ahead and get started with some space news right off the bat. First off, the debut launch of a Long March 6 from China. Check it out. We're not going to get too much more footage, so I'll just let you know that happened on Saturday, September 19th at 23.01 Coordinated Universal Time. That happened from the new launch pad 16 at the Taiwan, I hope I said that correctly, Space Center in northeastern China. This is a new generation rocket. It's using a new type of engine. It is not hypergolic, meaning they are using a uh, more environmentally friendly system of rocket propellant, I'm sorry, of kerosene, a highly refined kerosene, and liquid oxygen as their oxidizer. Uh, the first stage is powered by what they're calling the YF100 main engine. Uh, they've been working on that engine since about 2000 or so. The whole vehicle sits 95 feet tall. It can haul 1,500 kilograms or so. It's about 3,300 pounds for those of you in the U.S. Um, and uh, it's hopefully, possibly going to be the same engine that they use on the Long March 5 uh, and other future rockets that they're working on as well. So uh, this particular flight sent 20 satellites up. These were uh, satellites that were built by uh, Chinese college students, so that's really cool. Uh, and this is the most number of satellites that China has ever sent up on a single launch. So there you go. All right. Uh, that was, did I stall long enough for you? Yeah, sorry. Right, cool. All I right. managed to have the complete wrong rundown up. So I looked over and I was like, that information doesn't look that's, right at all. That's not the news for this week. You sorry. Know, you you want to just do, you could do last week's news. <laughs> I, could, I could, as those were the notes that I had. Just last so week. neat. Um, sorry about that, Speaking guys. Speaking of debuting rockets. <laughs> Uh, another debut of the Long March 11, actually, also from China. Oh, so, my wait, goodness. they debuted two rockets. Yeah, within like a week or two within time span. Within a week span. of each other. They, yeah. China is just kicking butt and taking names. They are. They are, which is really <laughs> impressive. Uh, we don't really have footage, but we have this really lovely picture. Picture! Look how there cool that is. <laughs> <laughs> the Long March 11 is a solid-fueled launch vehicle with a liquid fuel trim stage. Uh, it's developed by China's Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology. Uh, I'd like to thank the Academy <laughs> for this rocket. The idea is that it can remain in storage for a long period of time and provide reliability, uh, reliable launch on a short notice. That's why this vehicle was developed in that way. Uh, the particular mission was the ta uh, Tiangwang mission uh, 1. It had three small satellites that can demonstrate flying formation and inner satellite communication between the three in orbit, more like a satellite constellation as opposed to three separate satellites, which I thought was really cool. The Tiangwang 1A, uh, yeah, 1A, Tiangwang 1B, Tiang, Tiangwang, this is really difficult to say, I'm so sorry I didn't say it out loud at first. 1C were developed by the Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, the satellites are based actually on CubeSat architecture, with A and B being a CubeSat 2U, or two unit, and a the one C is being a CubeSat three unit. So I think the big takeaway there is it's a solid, uh, solid fuel vehicle. It's mostly a solid well, fuel, fuel solid. vehicle. Yeah, solid yeah. with uh, liquid fuel, uh, just to sort of help out a little bit on the sides. Oh, so the uh, like the roll control and whatnot, yep. just okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I thought that was really neat. All right, let's hand it over to Space Mike. Welcome back. 
yet again, Space Mike, you've got some more rocket launchy launchy news. I don't know what it is about the rocket launches this week, but like none of it has more than 10, 15 seconds of footage. So uh, <laughs> you've got the same problem with yours. Yes. Well, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, this is not a debut launch. This is a very old rocket. In fact, it's called Rockot. And with this, this was launched in uh, north uh, eastern Russia. And uh, here's the quick footage of that launch. You're welcome. This launch took place from the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, short footage. Sometimes with a lot of these, that's that's all you get. Uh, sometimes the sources are hard for this. But that particular launch uh, launched from the police sect Cosmodrome in northeastern Russia on the September 23rd at 2200 <laughs> Coordinated time, you know, the universal time coordination. <laughs> Excuse me. And with, that, with this launch, it was really interesting because it launched three particular satellites that are part of Russia's defense communication system. These are called the Rodnik communication system. And they had the, just the Cosmos designation for unclassified satellites that don't necessarily have a name like our GPS system. And so with these, it's adding to their system and possibly might have dual use in the future for commercial and public use. So that's very cool that they were able to do this. This was only the second launch of Rockot this year, which actually is pretty good considering the rocket's uh, record over the past several years as far as launches goes. And uh, everything seemed to go successfully. And uh, when the, something that I want to uh, just mention real quickly about this rocket is the upper stage of this rocket, the Breeze M upper stage. Actually, excuse me, this was a KM upper stage on this one. Is a really fun rocket to, or at least upper stage, to use in Kerbal Space Program if you can try to use the stock parts to make it. And you can send lots of different satellites to lots of different orbits with that because it's restartable and the propellant is really compact and there's just lots of really benefits with it so excuse me for nerding now on that but it's a very very good system with the space applications using an old ICBM converted for a space launcher so very cool for that but uh, um, as for uh, some some new rockets that are going to be uh, going back I'm going to pass it back to Ben who's going to be talking about uh, some more solid rockets yeah absolutely so uh, and actually speaking of new rockets I, I forgot to make a point of the uh, the new ch uh, Chinese rocket the uh, Long March 6 <clears throat> excuse me and mentioned that it was using uh, uh, liquid kerosene and liquid oxygen. Mm -hmm. Most of the Chinese vehicles up to this point have used um, a hypergolic fuel, and then they don't launch, unlike most of the other launch providers, they don't launch from like a coast. And so right. pieces of these rockets fall in Chinese villages, yeah. and these, these Chinese citizens have no idea, you know, this big rocket engine falls down, they have no idea it has super toxic really nasty fuel yeah, on board. Yeah, you can actually Google images of pieces of rocket parts and they're still sort of um, have weird colored uh, sort of smoke and dust. You have like a hydrazine cloud, cloud that they're walking into and you're like, the don't people, do that! But people are right there. It's, it's, it's a very odd, odd scene. So this is good because yes. this will eliminate that. Uh, it, it is a little hilarious because they're like, oh, this is, you know, environmentally friendly. It just gives off CO2. And, <laughs> right. and we're like, well, it's more friendly. <laughs> It's friendlier. Friendlier, certainly. Certainly friendlier. Uh, all right, so speaking of, uh, uh, Mike gave me a great segue that it then opted to destroy, as I do. Yes. Uh, that, that, that's my superpower, <laughs> is the ability to destroy Mike's seg segues. Uh, United Launch Alliance has selected uh, Alliant Texas Orbital ATK, Orbital Alliant Tech Systems, for the solid rocket boosters on the Vulcan uh, launch vehicle. They're also going to be moving to Orbital ATK for the solid motors on the Atlas V launch vehicle starting around 2019. So here you can see an Atlas V launch vehicle. Now, the solid motors you see on the bottom of that vehicle, so actually, if you move forward one picture, um, no, there should have been That's one. That's an awesome picture, there though. There you go. Uh, so the, the kind of highlight at the bottom. Those, that's the specific part of the rocket that we're talking about, the solid motors. Mm -hmm. Those are actually designed by Aerojet, Ro Aerojet Rocketdyne, and they're the ones that are going to be losing this contract. They're also losing the contract for the engine. Well, not necessarily losing a contract, but they will not be getting the contract for the engine for United Launch Alliance's Vulcan vehicle. So uh, that's a little bit interesting that there was this uh, pretty good relationship between United Launch Alliance and Aerojet Rocketdyne for so long. And now suddenly 
Behind launch of the alliance is like, you know, we're not going to use your engine. Also, we're not going to use your solids on this new vehicle. Also, we're not going to use your solids on our old vehicle. Now, actually, if you could go back to that picture for me, um, if you look at the solids on the vehicle, you'll notice the nose cones kind of, they're aerodynamic nose cones that kind of jettison up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, ATK, Orbital ATK, Alliant Tech Systems, doesn't actually use that same kind of nose cone. So while this will be a drop-in replacement for the Atlas V vehicle, you, we may see a slight modification of what the very top of those look like. So I don't know if they've decided if they're going to modify the nose cones, uh, if, if Orbital ATK is gonna modify the nose cones to make it as close to a drop-in replacement as possible, or if they're just going to leave their traditional, they're more of a, a triangular nose cone. It sounds like they're gonna keep their existing nose cone and then just kind of drop on these new solid motors uh, in replacement of that. Um, so, yeah, the Aerojet Rocket 9 used to be the primary propulsion supplier for United Launch Alliance rockets, which was the Atlas V solid rocket boosters, the RS-68 engine for the Delta IV, and the RL-10 upper stage engines for both Atlas and Delta. And it sounds like starting around 2019, 2020 or so, most of that will start going away. By the year 2025, most likely all of that will be gone, and all of that business will have vanished unless something radical changes, which also brings into that whole play of that $2 billion buyout that we were talking about right. earlier. Now there are talks that they're trying to increase the bid, but nothing's solid just yet. So Aha, there's solid. some- <laughs> Oh, whoa, oh, zinga, whoa. Uh, so- uh... <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're not. I'm only a little sorry. <laughs> so it's an interesting climate. I'm not sure if there's some sort of political game going on or if Aerojet Rocketdyne is just way too expensive, which is possible, or maybe a little bit of both. Right. So uh, it'll be fun to watch over the next uh, year or two how this all plays out. A lot of drama. Drama! Yeah. Super drama. Speaking of super... Wow. That was a terrible segue. I Anyhow, liked it. I'm glad <laughs> you did. Great. All right, Mike, 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 give us a segue. Give us a segue. <laughs> segue, Mike, do it. What? Poor uh, Mike. On the spot, right now. Let's right. go. <laughs> Speaking of things that are for sure, uh, no, I can't do it. I can't do it this time. I can't. I can't. I can't go from terrible rocket news and good rocket news to, to supermoon. I can't do it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, and neither can I. So there's going to be a supermoon eclipse. Boom. What is a supermoon eclipse? Well, this is hilarious because this is like totally the wrong kind of what eclipse. What happened but to that picture? But just ignore it's, that it's, for a moment. It's such a supermoon. It's got to be carried in by like Atlas. Five. I guess. Oh, I didn't the problem with that picture is that's a solar eclipse, Thank right? Thank you. Precisely. I don't know. Like, who runs this show about around here? Eclipse. Do we do we have any pictures of a blood moon? That's what we're looking for. <laughs> okay. So the thing is that <laughs> the moon uh, is in the picture. I don't know what your problem is. Is that even our moon? How do I know? Anyhow, what no, kind of Mickey is... Mouse operation is this? Exactly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, Jared is going to give us endless, endless oh yeah. trouble. Oh yeah, so now. yeah, if you want to know anything about this, uh, please watch the space pod that our correspondent Jared did because he did a really fantastic job, way better than anything that we've done about this story already. So, there's a super moon eclipse. <laughs> Could, couldn't have used a screenshot on that. <laughs> no, I could have. I don't know. Yeah, anyway. I mean, that wow. image, I go back to, that yes. image is epic fail in so many ways, right? <laughs> so, so many it's ways. It's the wrong kind of eclipse. And then the bottom still has the, the oh, atlas from the previous shot sitting underneath there. Yep. Okay, just, just, so, oh. just so everybody knows. Yes. That's the picture. <laughs> there you go. That's the picture. <laughs> that's. Oh, awesome. What's going oh, on here? One of these things is not like the other. Okay. <laughs> got your, got your layer, layers in Photoshop screwed up or something. What's going on? Oh, that's epic. Oh, my goodness. So epic. And I had nothing to do with it. This is so perfect. So the thing about the supermoon, <laughs> the, the reason it's called a supermoon is because uh, the Earth is here, if for instance, and the moon goes around the Earth. But it doesn't go in a perfect circle. It actually goes in more of an ellipse, like a, an oval. These are fantastic graphics. Yeah, no, because uh, that's all I've got at the moment. Anyway, so and the closest part, when the moon is, is the close part to Keep the moon. Keep talking. All right, great. When the moon is closest to Earth in its ellipse, that's called the pedigree. And when the moon is at closest to Earth, it, for obvious reasons, looks a little bit closer or bigger to us. It looks per about 14% bigger and about 30% brighter which is really cool. Now. I have to correct you, it's perigee. Perigee, what did I say? Pedigree. pedigree. Oh, I'm so sorry, find, yes. I was trying to find it a is moon perigee. Globe. 
Trying to find the moon globe. Couldn't this is, I was freaking out because it's in the kitchen. And I was freaking out because Ben just got up in the middle of a live show. That's what my problem was. It is called Perigee. P -E oh, this show is already disintegrated. Oh, I know. Oh, goodness. Anyway, the lunar eclipse is when the, the, you have the sun and then the earth and then the moon. The, that particular picture was a solar eclipse what where you you've got the moon, or I'm sorry, the earth, then the moon, then the sun. So this is where the moon goes into yeah. Earth's shadow. That's what a lunar eclipse is about. Now, when that happens, uh, it has a tendency to be called a blood moon because it has sort of a red glow to it. So not only are we getting a really cool blood moon uh, eclipse, but we're also getting it as a super moon. And that's why this is so interesting. Thank you, stagehand. Thank you, Ketty. Not that we need it now, because but that's awesome <laughs> anyway. Uh, it's since, gonna roll off the table. It's yeah, gonna be it hilarious. Is. Since the 1900s, this has only happened five times. It happened in 1910, 28, 46, 64, 82, and it's going to happen right now in 2015. Not right now, but it's going to happen in 2015. And the next time it's going to happen is 2033. Yes, Mike has a comment. Why do I feel like I'm in trouble? This is the worst oh. story we've ever done. I love Why this story. Why are we dragging this out? Let's oh. All right, no, go ahead, Mike. No, you're doing a good job trying to trying trying to fuddle through this. But uh, something else I want to mention is not only is this a blood moon. Yes. Not only is this a super moon. Yes. This is the fourth blood moon in a row, which is called a tetrad. And uh, yes. I'm sure Nostradamus and all sorts of people predicted that terrible stuff happens. And it's interesting because all of those years and dates that you mentioned, you know, there were lots of really crazy things that happened right around, you know, when there's four blood moons in a row called a tetrad. And so I think that that's uh, also really interesting. So we have all of these really cool phenomenons happening. And that's uh, this Sunday, right? And I'm definitely going to be trying to watch in that. It's going to be last for like an hour and a half, I believe. Yep, what, an hour and 12 minutes. About it. Mostly visible from North and South America, Europe, Africa, parts of West Asia, and the Eastern Pacific. And if you're not in those areas and or you have a cloudy view for whatever reason, NASA does have a live stream on Ustream. They, so, they do a pretty good job with their Eclipse live streams yeah, too. Yeah, they, they can, do. They can bounce from observatory to observatory to find one that doesn't suck. This is so <laughs> great. I love this story that I have had no input in on. Coming from Marshall Space Flight Center off of views not just from there, but also Griffith Observatory here in Los Angeles, Adler Planetarium in Chicago, uh, Fernbank Observ Observatory in Atlanta, and other locations across the United States. So hopefully, please, please, please go see this because it should be really interesting, really different, and something that's not going to happen for way too many years. And it hasn't happened in way too many years. So there. There you go. Speaking of SpaceX, Mike? <laughs> but, yep, that's the way that's gonna go now. <laughs> so half the internet loves this show and half the internet hates this episode because of how, oh how yeah, this incredible episode is go down the news has fallen sure. apart. All right, take us, <laughs> what, talk to us about the uh, well, Falcon Well, uh, speaking 9. of SpaceX, uh, they are uh, on fire, getting ready for their next return to flight mission. Check out this uh, brief footage of a static fire test. It's not launching, Mike. It's not launching. <laughs> Well, this was just an engine test. This was a static test at their new uh, uh, static fire test stand in McGregor, McGregor Texas with a new uh, uh, flame trench dug out for it as well so that they can actually do static fire tests from there. In the past, they were able to do uh, uh, just engine tests, but not a full up, full core stage test in that configuration at McGregor Texas. They needed to do those primarily at Cape Canaveral, and hopefully soon they'll be doing uh, a lot more of that from uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. I haven't been well, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, with this whole test firing, this is for the new version of their Merlin D, the upgraded version of these engines that will have more thrust. And not only that, but the fuel is condensed with uh, rocket science magicry. And they're going to be able to get a lot more performance out of this rocket and out of these engines. And not only that, but the upper stage engine, the, the Merlin D vacuum, has also been upgraded as well. So there's lots of really cool things that hopefully 
hopefully will take place with the next launch with that. As for when that next launch will take place, SpaceX hasn't said for sure when the next launch date could be. But Elon Musk did say in a statement recently when he was at a forum in Berlin, he said that we hope to launch again in a couple of months. I guess maybe six to eight weeks or so from now, if things go well, we'll be able to land the rocket. Although I'll be happy if it just gets into orbit, of course. So the it won't launch any earlier than November 17th, but hopefully mid-November, late November, hopefully we won't have another launch attempt on Thanksgiving like we did in the past. But <laughs> if so, hopefully everything goes well and that return to flight will happen this year and everything will be successful for that. So very cool, very cool news for SpaceX. And uh, speaking of main topics. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, before we go into break, a grutter 87 in the chat room asked, is the upgrade limited to just the fuel density space mic? No, this is actually an upgrade of the, the engines themselves. In the past, this is uh, it, it has to do with how they're able to throttle the engines. In the past, they were throttling the engines to only uh, between 60 to 70 percent. And with this, they, if they choose to, will be able to go up to 100 percent and throttle up and down through the various stages of flight. And with that, they'll be able to get a lot more oomph getting off the ground and hopefully won't have uh, uh, as much of a hard time getting through uh, the maximum dynamic pressure when you're going through that layer of the atmosphere and we'll be able to get even more performance out of the first stage so that when the first stage does separate from the upper stage they're in a much higher uh, altitude and we'll be able to deliver satellites and payloads and dragon capsules to higher and more distant orbits and destinations so uh, it's not just the fuel density but it's actually how they're able to throttle the engine and it has to do a lot with the plumbing of the engine I won't go in, in too, too much depth of it because some of it is beyond me as well so i'll admit that <laughs> but uh it, it has to do with the throttles as well as as well as the fuel density so great hope that answers your question thank you speaking of fuel density we're going to take a quick break and when we come back commercial space flight updates stay tuned we'll be right back And welcome back. Uh, that is one of two calendar updates that we have this week because, again, China is kicking butt and taking names. Also, we basically get one launch starting from Monday through Friday, one launch every single day. That's going to be pretty awesome. And that's all powered through Launch Library. And I wanted to give a shout out to all of our librarians who are keeping the Launch Library up to date. At this point, I believe it is the most up to date and accurate database of la launches on the internet from what I've been able to find at least because I'll look around and I'll see other databases that are close but are missing some of our information like if you pull two or three of them together you kind of get there but ours seems to be like truly up to date even awesome. with the china launches they've been doing great i also wanted to give a special shout out to to wicked as well for really putting a lot of time and energy into the chat room now i know a lot of you have been putting time and energy into it so it's not just to wicked but he's gone above and beyond the call of duty for helping to make that library uh, what it is today. So thank you, first off, everyone and to Wicked for, for making all that happen. Also, a huge thank you to all the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed, uh, what is this, $5 or more to this specific episode. <laughs> if you would like to figure out how you could help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow and after watching this episode, I would understand if you don't, uh, you can head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Well, you know, we like to have fun. Right, you know, we're we're definitely you totally sound like your father right there. Really? You did. You did. Ah, we like to have fun. All yeah. right. Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't think he sounds like this. No, that's All right. not what I meant. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, so let's. I, the main topic for this week is a commercial space flight update, and basically, because there's so much. There is. We've got three mm -hmm. companies that are looking to return to flight. Mm -hmm. And first up, let's talk about SpaceX. Now, you talked about SpaceX in the news section, Space Mike, but. Give us a quick, you know, what are we looking for at return to flight? What's kind of the current status of SpaceX as a whole? Well, with this last failure, um, I was actually surprised at the backlash. There wasn't as much as I thought there was going to be. I thought that, you know, 
so many other co their competitors and so many people in Congress and the Senate would, you know, just decry them, just be like, oh, we can't trust them. Let's cancel the contracts right now. I thought it was going to be awful. But it wasn't. It wasn't so bad. Yes, there were some people who detracted against it, but the whole thing with this launch is if they're successful with this, then they will be able to return a lot of people's confidence in the company and in their services. But if the this launch has any problems or isn't successful, then you know, it then the what I imagined the result was gonna be from the first launch failure could uh, become a reality if it fails again with this next return to flight mission. So it's very critical that uh, things go off as planned and they deliver the payload, which just so happens to be an SES-9 communications satellite, uh, excuse me, a TV broadcasting satellite. I guess that's kind of a communication satellite, just different kinds of communications. Um, but with this, like I said, it, there is a lot, there's a lot running on this launch uh, that whether or not NASA and Congress and the Senate will continue to have com confidence in the company and continue to award contracts into them, to them for the future. So Space that's Mike, that's what, what I think is the biggest thing to this. What, what shirt are you wearing? I am wearing my cat shirt. It's got a bunch of cats all over it. Space I was going to wear my space cat uh, shirt, but I couldn't find it, so I figured Space Mike in a cat shirt was yeah. a good. I, I, I asked because Destructor1701 asked a question, Space Mike, are there any cats left in the world or are they actually all on your shirt now? Uh, no, there's a couple left. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so pretty good. Oh, uh, and then, you know, what, one thing, you, you mentioned the, um, the return to flight for Falcon 9, but it's not just a return to flight, it's a new vehicle as well. Mm-hmm. So that's that's a, right. That's I mean, it is it is a one. Falcon 9 vehicle, but it's an upgraded version. It's the version 1.2, I think, is what it, they're calling it right now. So, so a big a big milestone for SpaceX coming up. All right, mm -hmm. um, we also have the Orbital ATK. Uh, so Orbital uh, lost their Antares vehicle um, late last October. Yeah, yeah, like a year, almost a year ago at this yeah. point, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, that had the Cygnus space capsule on top. Now, their plans forward are a little bit different. They're not going to be returning to flight with Antares right away. Mm -hmm. They're going to be returning to flight with Cygnus. Well, they're going to be returning Cygnus to flight atop of an Atlas V rocket from the United Launch Alliance. So that will happen at least one time, if not a couple of times, uh, before they're actually able to re-release the Antares rocket using a new engine. So that is looking forward, like Cygnus should be flying this December, I think it's mid-December, I don't have the launch date Something off the top of my like head, uh, but it, pretty quickly here. So they'll be able to resupply the International Space Station, that's kind of a return to flight for the spacecraft, mm -hmm. and then the rocket probably sometime in 2019 or so. Uh, well, go ahead, Mike. N November, November is the uh, Atlas V launch with uh, the Cygnus. So I thought they were going early December, but all right, November. So yeah, so ret return to flight for Cygnus late this year, mm -hmm. and then sometime next year-ish, Mercury, uh, maybe, right. uh, return to flight for the Antares rocket as well, which will bring, bring mm -hmm. them kind of back to the stack that they wanted, mm -hmm. uh, which would be kind of cool. Although with all the partnerships with, uh, between Orbital ATK and United Launch Alliance, I wonder if there's not gonna just be, if they just go, okay, well, why are we flying Antares anymore? Let's just let's fly on top of an Atlas V or a Vulcan or whatever. Well, Vulcan won't be out in enough time, but you get the idea. Why not just kind of leverage that relationship a little bit more? Uh, we've also got uh, the Virgin Galactic return to flight. Richard Branson said, um, was it last week? This week? Sometime recently yeah. that they do not expect to fly again in 2015. So they will not return to flight this year. They are expecting to return to flight early 2016. And then <laughs> the hope is we're, we're a year out. Yeah, I know. I know. We're a year out from paying customers, and Richard Branson has said he will still be the first person on the, the commercial flight. You know, outside of the test flights, once mm -hmm. they start commercially flying, he will be on that first flight. So He and some of his family, right? His, yeah, absolutely. Yep. I mean, that's, that's uh, showing a lot of um, faith. I guess. Although what's interesting is x -Corps is catching up. Mm -hmm. So x -Corps has just moved their offices from uh, Mojave here in California mm -hmm. to... Midland? Midland, Texas. Midland, Texas. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like a lot of that's really coming together. And Lynx mm -hmm. seems to be pretty far along at this point. There is a chance... I don't know if you've heard anything, Space Mike, but I'm starting to think they'll start flying early next year. 
I, I, I have. Um, I've been trying to keep up on that. I had a space pod a couple of months ago about uh, their progress at that point, but their engine development testing is done. It's complete, except for, you know, actually doing a real test firing with the actual vehicle in flight. But as far as how the rocket is supposed to perform on the Lynx vehicle, everything looks good and it has exceeded their expectations. So everything looks good on the engine side of it. Now they're still just assembling the, the vehicle itself. And they have lots of different subcontractors that are building parts of the vehicle. Uh, they like a lot of different composite parts and obviously you know in their small little you know 1940s hangar in Mojave they don't have the the capacity to, to manufacture composite materials. So that's okay that they're getting all these uh, subcontractors but they're making sure that everything fits. They're um, assembling it onto the the first uh, test vehicle the Lynx Mark 1 uh, and just the experimental vehicle. There is some talk that paying customers will fly on that particular one, but then other X Corps employees are like, no, no one's going to fly on that one except maybe X Corps employees. So uh, it's confusing on that. But the vehicle itself is coming together, and hopefully, uh, early 2016, hopefully, maybe even this year, they might start doing drop tests or something like that if they're if they've actually completed the uh, um, the, the 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 airframe and and assembled the wings and the strakes and and have everything ready to go with the alien ailerons, I can never say that right, and <laughs> everything else for the vehicle. So um, they kind of did their space plane in the opposite way that Virgin Galactic did. Whereas Virgin Galactic built the airframe and did drop tests first and was still developing the engine, x -Corps developed the engine first and proved it and got it up to where, as far as they know, that they need it to be and then are continuing on with uh, actually building the vehicle. Of course, they've done wind tests and everything else to prove that their specific design right now will work. So now the only thing left to do is put all the parts together and test it in real life. So hopefully that will happen in the next couple of months. A little, little harder than just putting it together and testing. I mean, there's, they're wow. building this. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> just you know, glue it together. It's just like a kid. <laughs> Snaps on Legos. Oh, yeah, like Legos. Yeah. Like Legos, yeah. yeah. Uh, so <laughs> that'll be exciting. And so I think x -Corps and Virgin Galactic will kind of end up being kind of neck and neck as to... Uh, and it doesn't really matter who flies first, right? Just the fact that we'll have multiple providers allowing humans to go to suborbital space. That's a great first step for us to actually open up the frontiers of space. So I'm really excited to actually see that start to happen. Ixnay in the chat room said, uh, I kind of have a feeling that Blue Origin's going to beat them all. Oh, then you've got Blue Origin, who... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right? They've announced their Florida test, uh, their Florida site where they'll be testing their engines and launching mm -hmm. their suborbital vehicles from as well. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, Do, right. Does anyone know in the chat room, I can't remember, what, what was the altitude of their last uh, test flight that they did that they actually released video of the Blue Origin? Because, you know, uh, are they ready to go? Are they ready to start? Like, they could beat both of the both Virgin Galactic and X, X Corps. How do we know it's Blue Origin? <laughs> they don't say anything. They don't say anything. They don't say anything. They're like, hey, guys, guess what? We launched. And we're like, wait, when did, how did you, when did, when did, how did, when did that, nobody freaking knows. Like, it's the most frustrating thing ever. It's not even like, oh, we think we're going to launch or we're going to try and launch or, hey, we've got some tests. They just come out and they're like, no, 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 really, here's a totally produced video of this vehicle that you didn't even know that we had from a test site that you were sure sure that we had. And we totally just, like, did something because, you know, you heard rumors about it. And here's the whole thing. Like, what? I, what's it? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they for, you know what? Honestly, they might have already beat everyone, and we just don't know yet because they haven't given us the video. They could be selling tickets well, see, and flying people to space. We it's have so no idea. Stupid. <laughs> it's the most frustrating they thing ever. They're going to have a space station and everything. Jeez. I can't support you if you don't tell me what's going on. Well, so, uh, <sighs> there is a problem in the space industry of people announcing things way too early. Oh, absolutely. And then not actually, you know, de delivering everything. Uh, or, you know, programs like um, uh, Constellation announcing it way too early. And then Absolutely. Yeah. So I understand the, the trepidation and the cautiousness of, you know, not announcing stuff until they're really ready to go. But uh, ready to go and already done is like what China does. <laughs> okay, fair, fair. <laughs> but, but, you know, they are, they're getting a little bit better. They announced in advance, you know, we're going to have a press event for our Florida launch site thing. <laughs> yes, right? thankfully. Thank you. Goodness. Thanks for inviting us, guys. <laughs> oh, wait, no, you did. 
just but what that for a but second. Joking aside, what they're yeah. doing is exciting, and what they're doing is very cool. And so you'll actually have three launch services providers yeah. with suborbital space tickets that yeah. you could you could buy a ticket to. Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, and X Core. There's a good Super chance exciting. all three. Well, I think Blue Origin is probably still a little bit like we're all like, oh, how far ahead? I don't. I'm not sure they're as far ahead as we're giving them. Sure, sure, sure. So I, I think they're probably still 2019, 2020 question mark. I give them 2017, 18. Are we talking like orbital late 2017 or, origin or suborbital? Suborbital. 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 Paying, ca paying passenger suborbital. I think 2018. Okay. I'll give them 2018. I'm thinking 2019. Sure. Uh, Mike? Business in full swing, 2017, maybe. All right. All right. So everyone remember this episode. We're applying prices right rules. Yes. Closest without going over. <laughs> yep. Uh, that's, uh, that's who will win this particular one. All right. <laughs> Blue Origin, then you also have Bigelow Aerospace. They seem to be in a hibernation pattern, and I don't foresee that changing anytime soon. Ultimately, what they need is a... They're hiring, ahead. actually. Words? Say what? again? Bigelow Aerospace is hiring, which means that wow. something is ramping up over there. Nice. Mm, I, I'm not qualified for any of the positions, but they are hiring. So if any <laughs> of y'all are rocket scientists or mechanical engineers, go check it out. So how many places are they hiring, though? Is it a lot, or is it just a small handful? Well, they've, they've always only had a small handful. I think the most they've ever had is like two to 300 employees. But I think this round, and this was like a week ago that I saw this. This was like 37 to like 40 positions that were still available. So, But that's not bad. I mean, if you only have two or 300 people, that's like 10%. That's good. That's, oh, that's yeah. a decent last increase. Layoff, they went down to like less than 50, I think. So, so actually, as of right now, they might be doubling their workforce. As, as the yeah. chat room was pointing out, we've got the Bigelow Beam module being sent up to the International Space Station. So that's a pretty mm -hmm. that's a pretty cool thing. So I, I guess hibernation is the wrong word. I'm thinking the Bigelow, uh, I'm really only approaching this from the commercial space, non-governmental kind sure. of side of it for this update. That w That's a fair statement. And, and it, it's unfair to do that to Bigelow when SpaceX is doing government stuff too, as is everyone else. So, uh, fair. Um, but they're... they're Commercial space stations, they're still kind of on the back burner for now. Not because they haven't figured them out. They basically have them, from my understanding, is essentially done and ready to go for the most part. Except that no one can lift them up. Right. They need a super heavy lift launcher to get them up there. So that's kind of what they're waiting on right now. And then transit to and from said thing with, with passengers. Maybe that'll be Blue Origin. Hmm. That'd be cool. There's a chance. Really Something cool. else that I find interesting about Bigelow that tells me what their status is is in the in the past in years past you know we got news press releases saying that you know they had finished everything with the um, uh, the environmental system so that they can have life support and everything like that and that you know they've tested out the 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 mylar itself and and the water layers and everything else so that you know everything is good for that but recently. Tim Pickens, a pretty uh, famous rocket scientist and engineer, recently got hired with uh, Bigelow, probably th this whole uh, hiring round that I'm talking about. There was a press release about it. He left Dianetics to go to Bigelow Aerospace to work on the propulsion modules for the, big, the BA-330 modules. So that tells me that they still need a little bit of work on the propulsion modules, even if someone was had a rocket that was ready to fly them tomorrow, you know? So that's what I think anyway. All right. Just so my opinion. Any, any last updates in the commercial space sector that you, uh, you've got, Space Mike? Um, one of, this kind of has to go into the suborbital tourism thing, but we might not want to uh, count out uh, Cop Sub and also Arca Aerospace. So well, I don't think we've ever counted They might counted be able to out. do it, too. I don't think they'll beat the, the other three companies that we talked about, but they might be launching people in the future, too. So yeah, I don't think we've ever, know. we've never counted out Copenhagen suborbitals, Copenhagen, uh... <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's not a question of if but when with those guys, I, I think, really. Right. That, right? Yeah. They, they are definitely doing something. It's just when are they going to do it. Um, and then uh, Dr there's Dream Chaser as well, which is uh, kind of moving on a path forward slower, maybe being dropped from a strato launch vehicle now, maybe being worked on over in, uh, what is it, with ESA, the European Space Agency, I think it was. Um, Specifically so the German Space Agency. Mm. Yeah, so... They're kind of trying to find a home for Dream Chaser. They're kind of sort of finding homes for it. I really hope they do. I think Dream Chaser is one of the cooler vehicles that's being designed right now. Uh, and, and I don't want to see it go away mm -hmm. uh, just because it didn't, didn't make it through the next uh, NASA funding round. So 
All right. Uh, so, all right, there you go. If you've got more updates that you were thinking of in the commercial space sector, if you've got questions about commercial space, go ahead and leave them in our uh, comment section in YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you want, Reddit, all those different areas. We're going to take a quick break. And speaking of comments, when we come back, comments from our last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. That's right, two launch calendars in the show. That's how many launches are happening this week. How awesome is that? That's a great problem to have. Yeah. Uh, before we get started with comments from our last week's show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have, contrib who have contributed at least $2.50 to this episode. Uh, these are also people who are going to get a copy of After Dark, uh, as soon as it's made available mm -hmm. online. It's one of the perks, and at different levels, you get different rewards for helping us out. But you don't have to contribute $2.50, you don't have to contribute $5. You, you contribute whatever dollar amount you feel is fair. If you think the show is worth one penny, you can contribute that. And that's this group right here. From one penny to $2.49, these are the people who've contributed to, to the show, and just as little as one penny, it gets your name in the episode as well. So a huge, huge thank you to everyone who's helping to contribute to tomorrow and to help bring it week after week. All right, let's go ahead and get started with uh, some comments from last week. This is gonna be a fun comment section, I think. Oh, it's been a fun show, so it better not be a sucky comment section. All right, let's go ahead and get started with Miguel, I believe it is. Oh, goodness, yes. So this is uh, Miguel. Oh, we start with a long one. Yeah, comes off of mm. YouTube. I'm not the one who chose them. One of the main problems of today is actually a holdover from Apollo when up to 3% of the federal budget was used and space industry was beefed up to giant yet unsustainable levels. This is when congressmen notices all the jobs in their district and try to keep them and why NASA has become, at their behest, super inefficient. That's when, I start, that's when it started and it's going to be very difficult to reverse a decades-long trend. Basically a very long way of saying in the Apollo era, NASA turned into a jobs program. So, um, you, you know... Yeah, but at the time, accident. they could support all of those jobs. On accident, right? Not, not yeah. And, there were know. a lot of jobs that needed to be done, and uh, Mike, is, Mike is talking. Build the manufacturing there. facilities in the South so that unemployed people could have jobs, and that's how they sold the whole program to Congress. Oh, it's a jobs program, too. Everybody's going to make money. Yay. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. It, yes. Which is unfortunate. And it was, but... and they did. Yes. But then we were done with it. Yes. And we've not really moved on. And no. so I don't necessarily disagree with the comment. Um, I don't... So we harp on NASA a lot, and I don't really think it's actually NASA's fault. The engineers that I know at NASA and the employees that I know at NASA, mm -hmm. they're not sitting there going, well, this is a jobs program for me, and I'm just going to sit here and get a paycheck. No, these are yeah. passionate people yes. who want to get humanity to Mars. It's, it's not that side of it. I think it's the political side of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, not even NASA in and of itself, but the, the, the Congress mucking with NASA and sticking their fingers in it mm -hmm. and trying to make it into something that it isn't. Mm -hmm. I think that's where they get screwed up. And uh, if, we get, if we could get them to stop, <laughs> uh, NASA would probably be an, an organization that could get humanity onto Mars. But um, we'll see. I mean, they'll, they'll have space launch systems soon, so there's that. All right, moving on. This one Speaking of space launch system. Right? This one comes from uh, <laughs> Fabio Milan from also off of YouTube. Space launch system is dead. It will be scrapped in favor of the Falcon Heavy and its successor, the MCT, or uh, Mars Co Colonial is. Transport. Uh, we all know this will happen, but we cannot say anything because Congress. Yeah, no, we don't know that this will happen, and I don't think that that is a fair statement at all. Um, you know, S Space Launch System Block 1 is 70 metric tons to low Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. The Falcon Heavy is 53 metric tons to low Earth orbit. And you go, so oh, seven oh. seven zero or five That's three. That's the Block 1 Space Launch System, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm very certain that Block 1 will fly. Now, whether Block 2 flies or not, Mm, that's yet to be seen, but that's 130 metric tons to low Earth orbit. Mm. That is um, not quite three times the lift capacity 
of the Falcon Heavy. So that is, um, that's a pretty significant difference between the two. And then you go, oh, 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 but the Mars Colonial Transporter. But what does Mars Colonial Transporter lift? When will it be built? Yep. What information can you give me on the Mars Colonial Transporter? Yeah, Mike Shrug, you couldn't see it, but he basically went, mm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't know. And assuming that this, this rocket will be something that can replace Space Launch System is not fair because yeah. what data can you tell me about it? Exactly. It will have There was like one PDF from like 2005 talking about something called the Falcon XX or something like that. And that's the only like reference we have to something bigger than the Falcon Heavy. So yep. that's all we have to go off of. And it, that, I think that guy was fired and Elon immediately was like, no, we're not building Falcon XX. We're building something else. Right. Forget so all of that. Out of the gate, what awesome. you've got is Falcon Heavy at 53 metric tons to LEO. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Space Launch System Block 1 at 70 metric tons to low Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. I said LEO. I should have said low Earth orbit. Yes. Bad me. It's okay. <laughs> um, so, and that's, that's, why, <laughs> that's, that's why I don't think we can count out the Space Launch System, and I don't think it is dead. Also, it is acting as a jobs program, and Congress does love the Space Launch System because it's keeping people employed in their districts. So just assuming that it will go away is not a fair assumption. Then, so then we've got the issue of, okay, we're reusing the space shuttle main engines. We're gonna, then we're going to dump them in the ocean. So once we're done with the space shuttle main engines, then what? I think that will be the critical point. Hmm. Will we continue and build and design or build new engines to right. replace the ones that we've thrown into the ocean? Or do we go, mm, we're done with this? And keep in mind, by that time, we'll have a new president. So we may have a new policy for NASA. Right. Don't know. Speaking of new policies for NASA, next. And this one comes from Raul Duke, also off of YouTube. That was a brilliant segue. <laughs> that was, that was, I'm, that was I'm so I'm actually nice. impressed. Uh, <laughs> Pat you, myself on the back There you go. One. Do you have any idea what can happen as a new administration is coming to the White House? Do you think it can influence the Space Launch System and Orion System's development? Can you give us some idea about that? Thanks. Yeah, it can influence it a lot. Let's just go backwards one presidential administration, shall we? Sure. George Bush. Yes. Uh, he had said, hey, we're going back to the moon. We're going on to Mars. Here's my vision of the future. It's called Constellation. You mm -hmm. get the Ares 1, the Ares 5. You get the Altair Lander. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was a series of other stuff as well. And the coolest patch. And actually, it had the coolest patch, too. It really did. Uh, and here is what we're going to do. Enter Obama administration, we're not going to do any of that anymore. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to go to an asteroid. Ares 1 is canceled, Ares 5 is canceled, Altair is canceled. We'll keep the Orion module, kind of. Yeah. Uh, and instead of doing all that, we're going to build the space launch system. They didn't even want to build the space launch system. That was a compromise, right. by the way. <laughs> so, right? Because Congress was like, no. And they're like, fine, you can keep the big rocket. So, well... So yeah. it completely and radically changed. We just had to pivot. Mm -hmm. Like we, we almost did a 180 degree turn, not quite, but this huge pivot turn as to what NASA was working on. Mm -hmm. Ares 1 development just stopped, is, is done now at this point. There's an entire launch structure that was built that has never been used for a rocket that will never be built sitting down at Cape Canaveral right now. Mm. Blinky lights and all. Yep. Oh. Yep. So what could happen when a new president comes in? Well, we could reintroduce Constellation. Uh, we could go we back could do to that. anything. We could continue down the road of Space Launch System. We could do anything that they want. They might look at Space Launch System and go, why are we spending all of this money on this program? This doesn't make sense. They could look at Space Launch System and say, we need to spend more money on this program. This makes tons of sense. Uh, who knows, right? And that's where if you're in the United States and you're interested about space policy and you want to see changes in, in what's happening to NASA, the presidential election will absolutely influence that. So how you choose to vote will, uh, will impact that. Mike? Something that I find really interesting, too, about administration changes is sometimes the stuff survives, just like with Constellation survived into, well, at least Ares 5 from Constellation and Orion survived into the Space Launch System and Orion. But if you go even further back than that, you know, Clinton had X-33. We're not doing anything from that, but did learn a lot about composites. You know, we had George H.W. Bush, and he had the National Aerospace Plane. Again, nothing from that, but we do have the Wave Rider and a bunch of new hypersonic vehicles for military applications, so I guess there's that. And then you have Reagan, who had the uh, Space Station Freedom. That got canceled, but it became the International Space Station. So sometimes it's a good thing when these really big jobs programs 
plans are canceled and kind of restructured and be like, okay, we still have to do the, the jobs program, but how do we do this realistically and actually make this happen? Because we've been working on a program now for 12 years and have a lot of stuff on the ground to show for it, but we haven't actually launched anything, so we need, we need to actually do something. So even if there is an administration change and cancels everything and wants to restructure it, it might be a good thing and it might make things actually happen. I guess it all depends on who the next president is and and whether or not the Senate in, is in agreement with them. The Senate and Congress is in agreement with whatever that uh, president's plan is. So the point is that. anything can happen. And this is why when you're developing a brand new plan with a brand new president, if they were smart, they make it a 10 year or under plan. Mm -hmm. Because anything longer mm -hmm. than that mm -hmm. is probably going to get canceled or it's going to get radically changed. So, uh, and that's how we made it to Apollo, essentially. You remember, we made it to Apollo in nine years. There was a presidential change, but we were so far along in the process, they really couldn't stop the program. Right. So, uh, mm -hmm. and the same thing could potentially happen. All right, uh, we actually had um, two episodes ago, I think we talked about um, acronyms and why we don't use acronyms, yes. or you know, poorly don't use acronyms. Try not to use acronyms. Speak in English on the show as best Everyone we can. Everyone should be napping. Everyone should be napping, Ex exactly. <laughs> and uh, we asked you, uh, and then the next show, they said, ironic for a show called TMRO, to say don't, not to use acronyms. And we right. pointed out that TMRO is not an acronym, but if it were to become an acronym, what do you think it should be? So we're just going to whip through a few of these really quickly. So uh, here you go. Here's the first one. Arduino Scar said, uh, TMRO, tomorrow's mission realized off-world. That's a pretty good one. Oh, no, you don't, don't go back and forth. Just, Do you really like oh, that yeah, one? Just bring it back up and then skip to the next one. Go ahead. Next uh, one. This one uh, also off of YouTube. Uh, TMRO, the Mars Research Outpost or Two Married Rocket Oracles. <laughs> I like that one. I like two, that one. Two Married Rocket Oracles. I've never been called a rocket oracle. That's pretty well, you freaking are awesome. You're hereby known as a rocket oracle. Yay, right, I, <laughs> The most realistic <laughs> operation. Interesting, but all right. I mean, we are fairly down to earth, I guess. Uh, oh, <laughs> that says uh, tomorrow's media or research and organization in space. I'm sorry, tomorrow's media for research and organization in space. This one more like tomorrow is tomorrow is tomorrow's. Hmm. All right. I, I love the Force G Plus. Tim Froese. Yeah. Force G Plus account. Hilarious. Clearly, they did not like being forced into But I appreciate that you went through all of that trouble in order to make the comment, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. TMRO, that's, that's pretty clever. It's actually. good, it's good, I like that one. one. That actually made me laugh out loud the first time I read uh, it. I, this, I think, is my favorite one. Uh, from Sarah H. off of YouTube, three maniacs often rant. <laughs> TMRO. <laughs> yes. Thank you, yes. Sarah. All right, that is our show this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Uh, <laughs> Uh, stay tuned. After Dark is up next. Next, if you're watching live, uh, that'll be available. Otherwise, if you're a Patreon Plus subscriber, you'll get that immediately as soon as we post it. Everyone else will be available in approximately four weeks or so. Thank you for watching. See you next week.